Uh, this is a webinar about personalizing your bowling ball arsenal to win. So the outline and some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today, uh, and just to give you kind of a quick idea too, is the strategies of how to create a competitive arsenal for players of all levels, how to fine tune your ball reaction to prepare for events, some layout strategies to match up to your style of play. So we'll also talk about how to kind of fine tune the generic stuff that's in here to your actual game. And then also how to use Spectos. So if you have access to Spectos somewhere near you, uh, you can go and do the ball arsenal report or the ball performance test and get an idea um, of what, uh, how your arsenal kind of fits in relation to this. Uh, the other thing I'll ask you is if you have questions, feel free to hold on to those. We'll do all the questions at the end. Uh, it'll be easier than us trying to stop in the middle of the presentation. And hopefully some of the questions that you get along the way, we'll answer those as we go along. But we'll be happy to answer any questions at the end, so just hold on to them. You can type them in chat, and we probably will get back to them also. So in case you don't know who we are, I am Brent Sims, the Director of Coaching Technology. I've been at the Training Center since 97 originally, officially, excuse me, since 2001. Originally, I was the coordinator of the Training Center, so a lot of you guys that I recognize your names, it's because you've been here for lessons before. Um, and then obviously, to my left uh, is Del Warren. Uh, he's been in the industry forever, former professional bowler. Uh, he was at, uh, where were we at before, AMF and then track. I was at AMF for 10 years and track for five, and now I've been here over 13. Yeah, Me so and you, 13. Been, he's been wow. my boss for 13 years, so he's the vice president in charge of here. His other part-time job is he's the head coach of Weber. I guess he spends a couple hours a week coaching kids or something, right? A couple hours, yeah. Yeah, so. So now let's get into what we're here to talk about. So we'll talk, start with the strategies. So when we first started talking about this, me and Dell kind of talked about what do we want to make sure that people leave and really understand, or what are the biggest mistakes that they make? And you kind of put these three together, so I'll let you kind of talk about. Yeah, so um, I, I believe that we should be teaching and paying attention to what's going on in the real world. And so when I when I hear the same thing, and I do, you guys, a lot of you know, I travel all over the world. And what's interesting is bowlers are bowlers no matter where we go. And they have the same complaints and the same concerns and, mm -hmm. and the same mistakes, right? And so um, the first one is we need to hook the ball a lot to score. And along with that is, and you're at the tour stops all the time, and we expect to, that the, the guys on tour hook the ball way, you know, they hook the ball way less than what people think. Now they have a lot of speed and they have a lot of rev rate, but they don't cover as many boards as what people think they do. From time to time, the angles are extreme, but it doesn't last very long. So most people think, well, I gotta have more entry angle and I've gotta hook the ball more to score. And that is just not true. And then what happens along the other side is their their game suffers and they buy the wrong they buy the wrong balls with the wrong layouts mm -hmm. for their game. Okay. And the second thing is and um especially uh, with kids and we get a lot of I get a lot of students from that are here in Florida that are senior, uh, just like me. And so they say, well, you know, I don't throw a lot of ball. And I got to throw nothing but strong ball. So it's quite frequently I'll look in someone's bag and they have all pin up asymmetrics with surface. And that would be like to me going to a golf course with eight drivers. You know, you, you do need pitching wedges and, and seven irons and, and, and putters and so on. So. We're going to talk a lot about uh, this one today about um, using and having a variety of equipment um, and that it's not just your lack of rev rate that, that tends to want to make you uh, that wants to go maybe something a little bit weaker. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't really even like to use that term because it's got a negative connotation, something that flares a little bit less. And then they have too many of the same type ball, right? you know, because this is who I am. So I need this type of ball. And maybe I have a pearl, a hybrid, and a solid, and it's the same layout. And, and at the end of the day, a lot of them don't change enough too many of the sim similar surfaces. So similar surfaces meaning I use box finish. Yeah. And so they assume that shiny is shiny all the time, and I don't have to maintain that. Or And, and so what happens is all the surfaces kind of migrate together because the ball is rubbing against the lane, and there's no separation. Um, whatsoever. So um, those are the three common things that I see everywhere I go. And last year I was in four countries in Europe and uh, and uh, I was in Singapore for nine days. And so it, it's interesting aside from, uh, you know, Australia last year too, didn't you? No, it was the year before. Oh, okay. But it was at the end of, it was at the end of 2018. Uh, so run together after a while. 
so and it's funny that it, I see the same thing no matter where I go and um, and it's these are these are these myths so it's important that we talk about this because when people go to problem solve they think that this is who I am and this is what has to happen for me to get the best score because at the end of the day it's about improving your score right all right so we'll be addressing some of those so when it comes down to creating an arsenal, at the end of the day, what you're really doing is you're creating different shapes and different lengths. So uh, I've got to make sure that when I get done with it, I've got different options in my bag that give me different choices. Like he said, I don't want a whole bunch of drivers in there because having four different drivers is, well, wouldn't do me any good anyways because I can't hit anything anyhow, but it wouldn't do any pl uh, any real player any good. So Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you're wanting to create margin error. So given the pattern length and the shape it needs for your individual style so depending on the what transitions uh, what area that the transitions in right now and how the lanes breaking down you need a different shape to naturally combat that because the lanes going to give you something and you've got to give it something back to make sure that you're taking advantage of it so then making sure you can match up through your transition and then the, the some of the biggest ways that we're really doing that is with the cores you're controlling the hook by controlling the flare and then with the covers you're controlling the front to back and sometimes the side to side transition too. I know you had some comments and thoughts about that when we were worried in this one. Up well, I, I see, um, regardless of the marketing, I think covers have personalities too. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of categorize them into four different ones. I, I, I think there, there are covers that are earlier and smoother on the back. I think there are covers that are a little earlier but stronger in the mid lane. Mm -hmm. I think there are covers that are longer and and smoother on the back, and I think there are covers that are longer and more angular. I don't think every cover out there is longer and angular. How do I know that? We just watch, you know, and then when a ball comes out, I know at the training center when somebody launches a new ball and it becomes a little popular, we just tend to watch the interaction of the ball, the bowler, and the lane. Mm -hmm. And so I think understanding the personality of the cover stock of a ball and what you need based on your style, your commitment level, and where you bowl, um, really will add to your score because you'll, you'll buy the right kind of equipment for yourself. But also it will start, hopefully this presentation will eliminate a lot of the confusion so that you make smarter choices and you get more for your money. So one of the things we first put together was we're just talking about t uh, types of transitions and the tra uh, the transitions that Lane goes through. So what we were just talking about with the shapes that are needed from the bowling balls, well, we wanted to make sure first that everybody understands the transitions the lanes are going through. So I'll let Dell kind of talk about each of these and the characteristics of each of these, because unfortunately with each of these, it's not, okay, This is it's only this. It like transitions from this one into the other one, and sometimes you get stuck where you're not quite all fresh, but you're not quite all the next uh, transition either. So. That's where kind of the art and different players have to match up to that a little bit differently of when they make changes and stuff like that. So, so what you guys are looking at here is, is if you were sitting on top of the masking unit and on the head pin on the 20 board and you're looking back towards the foul line, okay? And this is a fresh pattern. This pattern's got quite a bit of shape. Um, it's not quite a house pattern, but it's, it's not quite totally sport either. Um, and so this is what it would look like on fresh. And on fresh, the challenge is, Usually you have a little bit of wet dry front to back and we want to control where the ball comes off all that volume and then when it hits the dry back end, we want to make sure that it's not too violent, mm -hmm. okay? And then sometimes today, we just had a rule change from USB-C where you don't have to put two to twos or any oil outside of the second arrow. And so what happens is now, um, based on some of the, my students is, the lane actually starts off wet, dry, front to back and side to side. And so it makes um, it, it makes it even a little more challenging. You know, if, if I'm looking at 10 and I happen to hit eight, that the ball goes Brooklyn. And if I happen to hit, you know, 11, 12 and the ball never, uh, never slows down enough. We're starting to see that right now on the fresh because uh, the lane is starting out to have a lot of shape right out of the beginning instead of migrating to that. So getting control on fresh is the key. So then the next transition that we called it was when the lane starts to open up. All right, so you start getting more friction. Um, you start depleting oil on the edge there, as you can see, and you're, uh, and you're starting to get more friction to the, if you're right-handed to the right. And a lot of times, um, 
if if you start with a blend in order to what I what I say take advantage of that added friction you need a lot stronger ball and that ball will um, usually an ASIM something pin up um, that ball will open that uh, area up to the point where there's more friction than there seems to be and you'll start to make a move to the inside and now you'll have a little more hold to the inside and you'll have a the, the ball will make it feel like there's a lot more miss to the right but you need something a bit stronger normally back in the day you know when I bowled on tour we started with our strongest ball and migrated to the weakest ball mm -hmm. but because patterns have so much more volume to the inside of the target you're actually moving into more volume Right. So a lot of times you actually start with your medium ball and now you go to actually a stronger ball. Makes sense. And then the next one that we talked about was the free hook, which if you look at the graph there, you can see where the orange has gotten really eliminated quite a bit of it. And now you're down in that dark orange. So what are kind of the characteristics and what you're seeing when you see this? How would you recognize this? Well, this is this is where people start getting confused. Right. Um, a lot of people just move their feet, not their target. Um, do I move parallel? Do I move diagonal? What ball do I go to? Um, and this is where you actually start going to something a bit, and again, I don't know how to coin this, something weaker, something with a little less flair, uh, usually symmetrical, um, because now you're, you're, you've depleted quite a bit of oil and the shot has started to move towards the head pin because we don't always move left and open our ankles to the right. We're starting to actually shut our angles down a little bit. Um, and if you notice that the big one here is that the dry is starting to migrate towards the head pin. Mm -hmm. And we can strike from the 14 board to the 19 board. So if the dry starts to get around 13, all I have to do is tip the ball one or two more boards down the lane and I'm in the pocket, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of people here is where they start throwing too much hook and they start getting even more over under. So because they see the free hook. So then they see the free hook them. and they say, we want more hook. And, and actually probably the best strategy is actually to start closing your lines down just a little bit, because again, the friction is starting to get on top of the head pin and you are starting, starting to get more wet dry. And then the last, transition zone that we kind of identified was burn. So you can see that dark orange there now has opened up quite a bit. Uh, it's migrated way more towards the foul line. You can also see the foul, uh, the oil at the head pen, or excuse me, at the foul line has dramatically reduced as well. So what are some of the characteristics and how would they know that this is kind of what zone, the transition zone at the ball? Uh, well, again, so you can see that the dry has moved very close to the pocket. Um, the lane is really cliffed where um, there's a lot of oil to the inside of your target and there's almost none to the outside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I was a kid a million years ago, what we considered wet dry to the outside of the lane. Now the, now the lane wet dries to the inside and there's always oil on the lane somewhere. And if you look, there's a, still a big puddle mm -hmm. uh, to the inside and there's a lot of volume there. So, but the key here is where do you want the ball to end up at the pocket? Right. And we know we want to be somewhere between 14 and 19. USB-C says flush in the pocket, 17 and a half. But we know even by studying CATS data and uh, now SPECTO that the pocket is over five boards wide, you know, when you're when you're mashed up. So mm -hmm. what I want to know is where is the dry and the oil relative to the, the final destination, which is the pocket. Mm -hmm. So here's where you need to start cutting down. We start to use weaker bowling balls, not stronger mm -hmm. balls, because we're on top of the head pin. Um, and where you can actually start to use balls that flare less um, and you can take advantage, not necessarily the hook, because there's plenty of hook out there. Take advantage of the hold area because mm -hmm. there's a tremendous amount of hold. So, again, it's just a mindset difference. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people look at this and say, I'm going to move way in and open the lane up. Number one, it's not necessary. Number two, you're probably going to have a little bit of a carry issue. And number three, remember that the dry part of the lane is now moving on top of the head pin. Mm -hmm. So we're actually at this point going to start to shut our angles down a little bit. Right. So what about a lefty? Does the left side of the lane transition the same way? Just does it a less to a lesser degree? Again, that's a great question. Um, you know, we're bowling on synthetic lanes today and topography plays a big, big role in the ball reaction. Um, but specifically on the left side, um, especially in competitive patterns, does the gutter play? And so, 
the lefties have to be aware of how many lefties they are and where are they going to play. Um, so they're not going to nearly face the transition that the righties do. I think we all know that. Um, but at this point, um, if the lefties are playing out far enough, they're not going to see anything that what's going on, on the right. Now, if they happen to bowl on a pattern where they got to play the inside, um, the dry sometimes gets so dry that it gets on top of the lefties and they have to crisscross each other. In the graph that you see here, if there was just a couple of lefties, they're still going to stay out towards more towards their gutter side or around the second arrow. They're not at this point, they're not going to see any of the traffic on the right side. Yeah, we did this test. There were no lefties balling. We purposely yeah. had all righties because we were just trying to see how much the lane would transition. Yeah. If you remember, because I think this was right around the time you started when we did these originally. So. Yeah, these were uh, all done by very, very times. good, the That's elite good. junior players in the state of Florida at the time. Yeah. So one thing we don't have in here, but I also want to address, what are the what are some of the factors in the environment? Because I know we talk a little bit later on about the environment. What are some of the factors in the environment that will make this happen slower or faster? <coughs> well, slower uh, would be if you had players with a little bit less rev rate. Mm -hmm. Slower would be, but in a different way, is um, you might have some players throwing uh, purple hammers. You, know, you might mm -hmm. have some urethane people that are really trying to just stay on top of the edge. And... Uh, so I know some of the some of you are cringing, but you know transition is transition, change is change. Mm -hmm. So at that point, if you had a couple people doing that, they're actually going to create more carry down, which would create more hold. Mm -hmm. And that's an opportunity to me. It's not screwing up my shot. It's it's an opportunity to maybe understand what they're they're doing and say, how can I take advantage of this? Right. Okay. And then of course, if you have more bowlers. The transition is going to happen faster. If you have less bowlers, it's going to happen slower. Yeah. So generally speaking, if the skill level of the group is lower. A lot of times they're all playing different places too. They don't get on top of each other. Whereas the higher skill level groups tend to get, everybody gets to a similar part of lane because they all go, look, who just shot 280? Let me do what that guy's doing. And so. Yeah, you you'll might have some straighter players with less skill, um, you know, to your point, playing to the outside and actually burning that spot more. Mm -hmm. And so I know at Junior Gold, for example, during qualifying, a big reason why the scores are lower, especially on medium patterns, is there's play, people playing all over the place. Yeah. And so the lane never really cliffs. It, um, it, in a lot of ways, sometimes it gets a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, but as you get down into the cuts and you get to the higher skill level players, they start to migrate on top of each other. Transition happens much faster, but the lane also develops much faster. And usually, usually the scores get a bit higher. And it's probably safe to say that when you're bowling, you're trying to predict how quickly this transition is happening because if you read or miss a transition, it probably dramatically affects how you perform that day. No doubt. Absolutely. So now what we're going to talk about is, so we understand the environment a little bit. How are we matching up to that? Or what do we need to do to match up to those different things? So how do we actually do that? So first things we want to do is we want to get data from that individual bowler. Um, if, it's a, if you're a coach or a pro shop guy, you can measure this stuff for them. If you're a player themselves, you can measure this stuff. A lot of this stuff you can go online and look it up. If you're not sure, get with a good pro shop guy uh, and have them help you do this. But you need to know what your PAP is, get that and measure that. Know what your axis rotation and tilt are. You need to be able to calculate what your speed and your rub rate is. Um, and then determine whether you're a, a speed dominant player, a balanced player, or a rev dominant, or you're slightly speed or slightly rev. Um, the chart that's here shows you what it would be if you were balanced. So a 17, this has both miles an hour and kilometers an hour. So the one that's highlighted there is 19 to 20 miles an hour um, or 30.6 to 32.2 kilometers an hour would be in the rev rate of 400 to 450. So if that rev rate were above that range, then that person would be rev dominant. If Whichever one is to the right is which one they are. So if it rev rate was the other way, then they would be speed dominant. Does that make sense? So it, it's really important, especially uh, for your average bowler that doesn't have a chance to practice a lot and they pretty much throw at one speed and one hand. So they're not going to have the luxury to say, you know, your normal axis rotation is 60 degrees. You need to cut it down a little bit. And this person doesn't practice. You know, they love to bowl. Um, you know, maybe they practice once a month a little bit here and there. So the way they throw it is pretty much the way they throw it. So um, I would say most amateurs today um, that are not seniors tend to be a little bit on the speed dominant side. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then as you get older, your ball speed goes down. I would say a lot of our seniors are on the rev dominant side because they simply don't have a lot of ball speed. Yeah. So this isn't this isn't a 
they, they have a lot of ball speed, so therefore they're speed dominant. It has to do with the amount of RPMs relative to your speed. And also a big one um, is axis of rotation. How much do they turn the axis? Because it's very difficult to go straight up the lane um, if you don't go up the back of the ball with these reactive balls today because they hydroplane in the oil and they really respond to the friction. So um, the pro shop operators and the bowlers out there, you really have to take, you know, back in the day we call it our A game. And, and you know, your league bowler and your bowling enthusiast, that's pretty much what they have. And so um, – we just got to try to make that as good as we can and make smart choices. But all of this data is really important um, of knowing who I am as a bowler and what time, what amount of time do I put into practice. Um, mm -hmm. All goes into the decision making with the, what type of equipment that I choose and what are the layouts on the surfaces. Right. And the other stuff that you were, you need to understand, which you just kind of started kind of a, talking about that a little bit, was the skill level of the player. I know for me, one of the biggest things that I see as a mistake with um, lower level players, especially, is somebody's new to the game. They went to the pro shop guy, and the pro shop guy with best intentions gave them four new bowling balls. The problem is they barely see the difference between five boards a hook, and now they gave them two bowling balls that are all two boards apart. So now when they're bowling, all they're doing really is fishing because – if this color doesn't work, I'm trying this color, but they don't understand. They don't see the difference between them. So you really got to understand the skill level of that player. Well, nor, nor is it necessary. So you would assume that that skill level player and believe it or not, training center, we get a lot of those. I'm 150 average bowler, 160 average bowler. I've been bowling a total for two years. Um, they haven't really even developed a swing or an approach yet. And you look in their bag and they have four bowling balls. Well, the last type of ball this person needs is something where they where that hooks a lot that res, that forces them to the left. Um, they can't control it. They don't know what to do with it, um, and they'd be better off with something they can keep in front of them and a little bit straighter. And need I say something symmetrically and pin down? They're going to score much higher and they're going to understand the game a lot more. Moving to the left for that person with a, a really strong ASIM is really confusing. Um, and it goes right in the line, well, this is what you have to do to score. And especially if all they ever do is they only see the recreational shot arena. That, that's the last type of piece of equipment you right. need to put in that person's hand. So really understanding who do they are, how committed they are to the lane, and, and how much time are they actually putting in um, – to their game to get better because right. it's very common to bowl three games a week. And then, you know, once a month on a Sunday when it's 15 bucks for three hours, they go in and spend a little time on their game. And maybe they have a, a USB-C bronze level coach helping right. them a little bit, but really that three hours, as we know, it turns in with phones and everything today, mm -hmm. turns into about an hour. Yeah, right? most, especially with people. So that, that's really critical to knowing who's in front of you and really matching that up. So understand what that person's normal miss is, too. All of us, if, especially for bowlers, we understand if I miss, am I going to miss to the left or am I going to miss to the right? For me, it's never to the right. Just That's how I'm – if I miss, it's almost always going to be the left. So my equipment Mine has too, to match Coach. Up. Mine too, Brent. My, yeah, give me a little bit where I can throw it over my yeah. left toe and Del can still bowl a little yeah. bit. So if I have to try to open the lane up, oh, you don't want me in. I need to be on the bench. So. Um, the other thing, too, is understand the environment the player's competing in. If they're only bowling in one house and all they're doing is bowling that three games a week at the league in that house, the arsenal they need is going to be a little bit different than that player that you've got that's – they bowl every night of the week at three different houses in the area. But they're bowling on three different surfaces, and one of those maybe is a sport environment. you got to make sure that you're giving them all the tools in their bag that they can match up and deal with all the different transitions that are going to get because each of those transitions is going to happen slightly different. Plus now when you start considering the age of the surface – you start considering some of the other characteristics of different bowling centers. Uh, one center is using a different condition than the other, so the transitions happen a little different. you got to make sure that you have enough shapes and choices in their bag that help them be competitive in the environments they're in. Right, and so we all are pretty much attached to at least one bowling center that we spend mm -hmm. a lot of time. So you know the characteristics of that center, and 
Um, that bowling proprietor is trying to make it one of his challenges to keep his customers happy is to make it, that environment as consistent as possible. So we probably don't need eight bowling balls for that environment, right? right? And and if anything, it, it confuses that person more, mm -hmm. right? And if you limit your choices and, you know, um, changing surfaces does a lot to a personality of a bowling ball, and then you teach that person some pretty solid fundamentals, they're going to get more use out of that ball and also know how to make a little bit, make make some moves. And when we're bowling on a house shot, a lot of times with a straighter type player, their moves aren't that big. Mm -hmm. um, and by putting something in their hand that doesn't match up, now they're they're moving out of the part of the lane that, that maybe they don't have the skill level for, and then the game becomes more complicated. I know a lot of times when people bring their arsenal in and they ask me to look at it, and what else do I need? Uh, there's a lot more often than not that I'm saying, I think you have too many options here and these two are too close to each other and we've got to separate them with surface where we've got to do other stuff. And I think you've just, because they're like, well, I get to league and I don't know which ball to throw and sometimes this works, sometimes this works. And it's just because when I start looking at them and really looking at the numbers and how they're laid out, they're just too similar. So, and I think sometimes customers think I'm crazy because they're like, well, what else do I need to buy to put my bag on? Why do you have nothing? If anything, you need to take two of those and recycle them and get rid of them and narrow it down to just these four so you don't have so many choices right. so that you're making better choices. Because if you're not out there strategically making changes and decisions, then all you're really doing is playing uh, playing darts and you're just hoping that you hit the middle of the board. And we certainly don't want our arsenal to have that type of strategy behind it. So we kind of broke it down into three different types of players. We have our house bowler, uh, which is the person that's only bowling that uh, that one center. Likely, if you're only bowling the same center on the same night once a week, a three-ball arsenal for you is probably enough. Sometimes you're going to have that including the plastic, sometimes a plastic on top of that. Uh, we've got a recreational tournament player. What we consider this is somebody that's mostly bowling house shots, maybe like an occasional sport or challenge. They're probably bowling in a couple different centers. They're bowling like city tournaments state tournaments and maybe that occasional tournament, but they're not really bowling competitive stuff. They're probably pretty good with like a five ball arsenal. And then a competitive tournament player, this is, number could dr dramatically change depending on what they're on. But this person to us is a mostly sport pattern. Um, so they're probably bowling mostly weekends. They might bowl their one or two leagues a week, but they're bowling a lot of tournament stuff. They're bowling regionals. They're bowling junior gold type stuff. They're probably bowling more scratch competition. They're bowling on different lengths of patterns. So in this instance, because they're bowling on a much wider range, they're going to need a six to eight ball arsenal. And then one of the notes we put on here is that same player, they could be junior gold or co collegiate. And most of the collegiate players we do have down there, I mean, when they go to a tournament, they'll usually, you take six with you usually, right? Well, tier two, five. we take six, and then and then uh, tier one, you're only allowed five. Yeah, they're only allowed to use five, but sometimes they'll take six and decide what their five are on site based on that specific venue. And the same thing happens at Junior Gold too. So they'll have a larger arsenal, and they kind of pick that uh, pick from that, which we'll talk a little bit later on how they kind of narrow it down to which ones they want. So now we're actually going to look at the arsenals and how do we accomplish this with the different stuff. So what we did was we kind of broke the bowling balls down into four different categories, if you could call them that. Um, so we've got the fresh, which that incidentally matches up with the transition zone it zoos on. And the name of these kind of matches with the transition zone that they're going to be used in. So we've got the fresh, which is kind of used to blend out the wet dry and create a very predictable ball reaction. If you remember what Del was talking about the fresh, he really, the biggest goal there is I want to make sure that it's predictable and I'm blending out as much of that wet dry as possible. And then we've got what our ball up was, which is in this instance, we're trying to create more shape and ultimately more margin of error. And it needs to be able to work in oil because generally speaking, this is when we're first moving into the lane. Lane's starting to hook a little bit, but it still needs help. It needs friction. So this bowling ball is going to be a little bit stronger than the first one. The late hook ball, which is our later transition, it's going to allow you to start shutting those angles down. It'll still hook when it gets to the dry. So if you miss out a little bit, we still want it to be able to come back, but it's not, it's also going to, uh, allow you to start to straighten the lane up a little bit more. And then the burn one, which is very smooth and weak, uh, is going to be almost no shape. It doesn't over -read dry at all. Uh, it's going to allow you to shut those angles down and uh, play the shim, as uh, you guys said that word. Play the shim. I don't know what that meant, but he did. So Playing the shim means you're, you're uh, it's not that the ball's not hooking, but you're, you're keeping... Uh, you have a minimum amount of angle going left to right. You do have some. Probably on specto, the angle would read, you know, somewhere less than one degree through the front. And um, and then you're really, when you bowl, what you have to understand is everyone needs a miss. 
So you need to either be able to miss right or left. And most people would prefer to miss left. So in this case, with this ball, the lane is saying when you miss, missing left is good. And usually in a tournament, if you can miss left and right, and you're confident, that's usually when you win. Okay, but everybody in order to score has to have one or the other. Um, most people would prefer to miss left. So th in this case, when they get super burned, a lot of times we, what we call is we play this shim where we played, you know, a two or, two or three board little um, strip of oil. And we just keep it to the inside of that strip. And it, the ball rides that strip all the way down the lane. And we shoot some of our highest scores at this and at that particular time. So this kind of breaks down and shows you of those bowling balls that we just talked about and relating back to the original players. So a house, ball, a house player is going to need that fresh ball and probably the ball up and then likely a plastic or urethane depending on the style of the player. Uh, for the two-handed, that's that plastic's probably going to be more like a urethane likely, right? Yeah, sure. So a uh, recreational tournament player, they're going to have that fresh ball, the ball up, and a late hook ball. And then they'll also have their spare ball, whether that's plastic or urethane again. And then the competitive player, this is where kind of it can be fine-tuned relative to the type of player, too. Um, so in a competitive tournament, they're probably going to have a different ball for fresh, for short, medium, and long. They're going to have two different ball ups, one that's probably more geared at their medium and one more geared at their long. Uh, they'll have their late hook, and then they'll have their burn ball. And in some instances, they're going to have different sets of those that they'll use for different uh, – arsenals relative to the environment they know they're going to, whether it's short, medium, or long, or whether it's a good surface, bad surface, wood, uh, synthetic. Uh, sometimes even at the higher level, they'll start th taking into account, okay, we're bowling on this conditioner this week, so I know this equipment matches up better and this arsenal matches up better for that, uh, that uh, conditioner than the other one does. So every ball has a purpose in your arsenal. Um, and I use a lot of golf analogy, not only because it, it makes it pretty clear to folks, but also I love golf. So, you know, you know, when, when I need that ball in this particular case, when I know I'm going to an environment, this ball fits that in terms of just the ball in the box, how it's made, what it's for. And then the layout pretty much complements the bowler. We adjust the layout. You choose the ball for the environment. You really choose the layout is really, um, more customized to the type of bowler you have and the line. What you know, are they, you know, Coach Borden was just here, right? So is he a roller? Is he a stroker? Is he a croaker? Is he a cranker? Some of his terms that he used. And really his message was very similar to the one we're saying today is that he doesn't really try to change the player as much as he tries to um, take what they do well and make it the best they can be. Okay, so you choose the ball for the environment and the situation. You choose the layout for the bowler to match up the player better. Yep. So let's talk about each of those ones a little bit more in depth. So we've got the fresh ball. Generally speaking, we're going to want that to be a low RG ball somewhere in the two four eight to two five two range. It's going to be a low to well, I guess it's a medium diff. Is o three o to less than o five. Yeah, yeah. Medium you can. Inch. It's medium to higher diff, but the, the key here is it's generally going to be symmetrical. Okay. All right, and the picture that you guys are seeing is from Blueprint. And I think it's Blueprint is an awesome, awesome uh, tool, especially for a conversation piece like this. This is actually a ball that fits that description with uh, a, a bowler with about 340 RPMs pinned down, and that's how much that ball flares on a medium pattern, okay? And the, the flare rings that you see that are solid are in the oil, and the ones to the outside are actually uh, in the dry. So this is an actual depiction. It's not something Brett and I came up with to make up. That's is actually a depiction of a ball that is pretty much described um, on your right-hand side there. Yeah. So you're going to end up with medium strong flare, but this is really more of a benchmark type re reaction. It's right in the middle. Um, and for a lot of you guys, your benchmark ball, it, it it's that ball that you're the most confident with. It's mm -hmm. the ball that allows you to play it, you know we mostly most of the time bowlers play in the middle part of the lane mm -hmm. right so um and this is also can be a confidence piece something that you're very confident in and you know this reaction so well that when it doesn't work it kind of points you in the direction you need to go so some examples there iq tour by storm web tour by hammer and the brunswick jagged edge so on this one here, so what we did was we also now 
you're going to see three slides here. We've got a speed dominant player, a balance player, and a rev dominant player. What we did was we had them take their ball that fits that spot in their arsenal. So in this instance, the fresh ball. And we had them do a ball performance test, which is what you see here on the right-hand side. And there's a couple of different things that we're trying to see on there. I'm going to turn this off. I'll turn the, us off. Sorry, you don't get to look at us during this. Um, on the right-hand side there, you see there's, I see the total hook which that's how many boards of hook that the ball hooked off of a straight line if it were being thrown down there. And there's really two things that we're really paying attention to the most on this is how much is the total hook and then how much total angle and then where is that angle at? So in this instance here, you can see there's 6.9 degrees of angle and that was 1.3 in the heads and the mids, so the first two thirds of the lane. And then the back third of the lane was the other 5.7 degrees. So this ball for this speed dominant player was a gravity of ball. If you remember, we said, generally speaking, for the uh, fresh ball, we aren't going to use an asymmetric. But, but this case, because this player's uh, speed dominant, we went with an asymmetric because in this instance with this player, is it, he's most comfortable when he can throw a little harder. If you tell him he's got to soften up to create that shape, he's not as comfortable. So it's actually a little bit stronger ball than normally we would go for. Um, and he's almost 20 miles an hour. And again, uh, you know, you there's an art to this. And so you get feedback from the player. This player happens to be a very, very good player. Mm -hmm. He knows what he likes to see, and he knows the type of reaction on fresh that gives him a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, with this particular player, um, this is actually what he uses, mm -hmm. and these are real numbers. Yeah. So now we'll go to the balance player, which this one was a web tour, but you remember that was one of the ones that was on our original list. Uh, you can see the layout that's there in the surface. Uh, similar type of thing here. I'm looking at the total hook, which is 14.9 boards, and then the total angle. You can see there's a little less angle on this one for this player, so it's 5.2. Uh, but if I were to compare this to his other bowling balls, you would see how it's different there. So it, this player's a little bit more balanced, so uh, you can see the layout's a little different too. And uh, just so that you know, I'll, I'll tell you who this player is. This is Tom Hankey Jr. And uh, uh, so he used to be very speed dominant when he, when he first came. And one of the things that we've worked on that uh, proved out that he had a lot of success last year was when we started to balance his ball speed and rev rate, he became a lot more versatile. And so now actually he's our balanced player, you know, as he's developed over time. And uh, he loves this ball. This ball matches him up, especially. In, and he's been able to use, believe it or not, a, a pin down type of layout, a symmetrical layout in a lot of different situations, not just a little bit shorter pattern. Um, this this piece be, is very versatile for him. Now for our rev dominant player, you can see it's 24.7 boards a hook, a uh, lot more angle obviously than the other players, uh, 10 degrees total hook, which 1.4 that is in the front parts of the lane, well front and mids, and then 8.6 degrees of that is in the last third of the lane. So a little bit different layout, you can see we're a little bit longer pen to PAP here. Because uh, this is also a web tour, so it's the uh, same ball as the other player. It's just that you can see what Dell was talking about earlier. We tweak the surface a little bit different, and the layout's different to match up with what this player specifically needs. And again, uh, you know, uh, this player, especially on fresh, um, with being very rev dominant at on close to 500 RPMs, I mean, control is what we need to do. In a lot of cases, these these types of players will use urethane you know, mm -hmm. or purple or, or something where they can make a mistake and not big four, you know, so. So now we'll go to the next one, which is the ball up, which if you remember, this was the RG that's 248-253. It's a higher diff. This is going to be usually asymmetric. Uh, it's definitely stronger than their fresh ball, usually a hybrid cover um, and usually a pen up layout. So Dell can talk about the layout that's here. Yeah, so this is um, this is usually a five-inch pin uh, on a strong asymmetric, and you can see here off a of blueprint how much this thing flares. But it's not just the total amount of flare; it's this it's this uh, the space between the flares. So you can see that that core is migrating uh, every revolution quite a bit, um, and so um, that's what uh, the the core moving inside the ball, um, how dynamic it is, and. What I do is I, I really like cover stocks that are versatile because if I need something to start up a little sooner uh, and be a little uh, more controllable on the back, you can always use surface. Um, and this is just a personal preference. This is my preference. I would rather use something that a cover that gets a little bit further down the lane like a hybrid than something that's a, a super aggressive solid that 
pretty much allows you to only do one thing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you took, if you had a tournament player that was able to take, you know, a couple of truckloads of bowling balls to a <laughs> tournament and he knew he was bowling on 37 feet with a lot of volume, then of course you're going to take a lot of balls um, that will allow you to have a lot of choices for that environment. But when you're going to a place where you're either limited on how balls you can take because you're traveling um, or the, there's rules that say you're limited or you only have three games to bowl, right? So you better make your choices pretty quick because you you, oh. you know you don't have a lot of games to to, to make your choices. Yeah, if you give yourself too many choices, you could spend too much time fishing and not the nine ball. Right. So you can see the the flare not only that the, this the flare on this ball is greater than the than the store, the fresh ball, but it's also the spacing is is much mm -hmm. uh, is much greater as well. So looking at the arsenal, uh, the, our speed dominant player. This was a Black Widow Pink. Um, so it's a lot stronger ball, a lot, a lot cleaner ball than his other ball was. If you remember his uh, fresh ball before was the Gravia ball. So a little bit different layout, 55 by 5 by 35. As you can see, 19.7 boards of hook, 7.3 degrees of total change of direction. So it's easy for him to get this ball to change direction and, uh, when he needs to open the lane up more. This is definitely the ball. And, and I like, again, I like this type of ball because, um, uh, when you combine a really strong core and a really strong cover, uh, as soon as that lane starts to transition, the ball wants to check, and you don't get to use this ball very long. So with, with this cover on this ball, I really I, I believe it's a great match because it gets through the front, and it allows us to use different surfaces too. It's a, it's a much more versatile cover to manipulate. So, um, But again, this, this, this core is definitely really strong. And, and again, the, the shape and how that ball interacts with friction and um, and the oil is completely different than first ball. Right. So the, for the balance player, so for Hanky's ball here, it's a Futura. Yep. See, so 50 by 5 by 35, so it's 25.2 total boards. If you remember the amount of angle he had on the first ball, this is definitely a lot more angle. It's 7.8 degrees total, uh, 1.7 in the front and 6.1 in the back. And it turns out that as Hankey's game has evolved, he really likes strong symmetrics, right? So, yet generally speaking, this two ball is is a is an asym, but in this case, because um, this is a pretty strong uh, symmetrical, the RGs are very low, the diff is very high, and that cover um, is pretty strong as well. Um, for him, this particular piece of equipment fits this category, and again, it gives him some versatility. Let's go to the rev dominant player. So this is a chaos black. A uh, lot different layout. You can see 80 by five and three quarters by 45. So it's 25.9 boards total covered. And then again, 10 degrees of total angle uh, with 1.5 in the front and 8.5 in the back. I believe that's the same amount of angle that he had on his other ball too. And so Again, I think another fallacy is that really strong players don't need a strong ball. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for them, uh, a lot of times they're going to move in and really get away from everybody else. And, uh, you know, when the ball starts to react in the front, it's not going to react in the back. So they don't th – this actually – this strategy for this type of player really makes the back end um, – if you notice the curve here, the curve actually is starting up pretty early and then – it, um, there's no sharp edges to that curve at all. And that has to do with he's deeper, number one. He's covering more boards. And the fact that this is a solid and it's really strong, um, it's not that angular at the back, which is pretty much the last thing this type of player needs. Mm -hmm. And then now we'll go to the late hook ball. So the characteristics of this, generally speaking, is going to be an RG of 2.52 plus, so a higher RG ball and ball, a lower diff, so less than 0.045. It's usually going to be, or it's almost always going to be symmetric in this one, right? Yes. So uh, with, usually speaking, a, gen, a pearl cover probably? Yep, um, or, or a cover that's going to get down and, and is going to be pretty responsive. Because um, remember the key here, as we pointed out when we looked at the, the lane patterns, is the, is the friction is starting to get on top of the pocket. Mm -hmm. So if we use something a little bit too strong, and I, and I will tell you that at tournaments, sometimes we've held on to our two ball a little too long mm -hmm. and you start to get over under because the dry starts to move towards the head pin and now with that stronger ball you start to get over hook right all right and so 
Um, with going with symmetric, the ball is going to, that's going to lengthen the transition. Uh, we definitely need something more on the pinup uh, line because we are going to play a little bit in, and we do need the ball to turn the corner. We just don't need the core to be so strong um, or so early. So, again, look, um, not just look at how much we've cut the flare down, but look at the spacing between the flare. It's getting a bit tighter and a right. bit tighter. So it's basically a baby two ball. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a weaker version of the ball we just came from. Mm -hmm. So some examples of this was a track kinetic amethyst, storm high road, storm matchup, and I put both of these on here because you can see technically the storm high road is a little bit higher diff, but this one's probably going to be more likely for the speed dominant player where they actually still need that little bit of help, right? Yeah. So you know, and, and again, the the flexibility of a symmetrical in this category is that if I do move the pin a little bit weaker, we're going to knock off a lot more flare than you would an ASIM. Or a DB8 turmoil. Well, not only that, I mean, a high road is like one of the most versatile balls ever. So We're not just saying that because Klimkin's here watching. <laughs> and then for the speed dominant player, um, he's got, uh, for that ball, he's got the MVP, uh, with the layout is 65 by 5.5 by 40. You can see it's 19.7 boards of hook, um, 7.2 degrees total angle, which 1.3 of that is in the front and 6.0 in the back. So you can, if you remember his proportion before, this is very, very little in the front. This is saving every bit of its energy towards the back of the lane because we don't want this ball doing anything up front because by the time they're using this ball, they need it for what it says it's for, for late hook. <laughs> Right. And remember, we're covering less boards. Mm -hmm. So we're moving to the inside, but we're, we're cutting, we're starting to reduce the angle a little bit from your previous, um, where, where the lane was previously. So the balanced player is using a heat with a 55 by five and a quarter by 40. So you can see it's 22.8 total boards of hook with eight degrees of uh, angle, which again, very little of that angles in the front part of the lane. It's almost all towards the back. And this uh, this particular ball, the heat was was our most uh, was our best what we would call the late hook or three ball. Um, the core cover combination in this was just matched up for this situation for a lot of different players. I don't think I ever drilled one that 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 didn't that, like that, that didn't like it. And then for the rev dominant player, um, we've got a kinetic amethyst. So it's a little bit weaker bowling ball than the heat, I think, right? No, same it's numbers. Same, okay. same numbers. Uh, you can see again though, uh, 27.2 boards of hooks so is still quite a bit of hook, but you can see again on that angle, almost all of the angles in the back part of the lane. So the, to me, the difference between the amethyst and the heat was the amethyst core was a little bit, or the cover was a little cleaner and it was a hair more ang angular, but they were like kissing cousins. Um, and so when you're playing different parts of the lane, you need balls that, um, you need bowling balls that kind of meet the shape and the part of the lane that you're going to be in. And again, the drilling technique kind of is, is customized for the player. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we'll get to the last one, which is the burn ball. So this is definitely going to be a high RG, so more than 2.55 and a low diff, less than 0.035. It's always going to be a pin down layout. Uh, it's going to definitely be your highest RG and your lowest differential in your bag. Um, and a lot of times, uh, we put the note on here a lot of times just because it's your weakest ball. Sometimes people get tricked into thinking, okay, it needs to be my weakest layout too. But you, I love weaker type cores with stronger layouts. Yeah. Um, and again, I, what, what I find the things that I teach is what's being successful in, in the real world, mm -hmm. you know, in, in that environment. And then collectively some of the trends that I see with all types of bowlers. And I see kind of the same thing. So, in my mind, like I've said at uh, the Junior Gold Seminars the last three years, is this is the ball that's really missing from everybody's bag. Mm -hmm. The high RG, low diff ball um, that you can keep online and and with, without drilling it pent up. Mm -hmm. Something that you just keep it in front of you and it doesn't do a whole lot when it gets on the back of the patterns. And I think the myth is that this ball won't strike. Right. We, sh we have shot some of our highest scores, not just at Weber, with, but with a lot of my players, mm -hmm. a lot of um, – uh, I coach a lot of the seniors that come out of the villages. This is the type of ball and the type of layout I put in their hand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their their response is always the same. Um, I don't think I can get to the five pin. And I said, well, if we were in the rubber ball era or the plastic ball era, maybe. But uh, we're in a reactive ball era. And uh, 
you always need a ball in your arsenal if you're a competitive bowler that allows you to keep your target and everything more up the lane. Mm -hmm. um, this is such a versatile piece of equipment for all kinds of styles, but when we move really deep and the, and the dry is getting on top of the head pin, I don't need response. I need that ball. I need us to be able to miss left or right and have the ball in the pocket. Usually when we get that deep, scores have gone from low to medium and they start to climb to get higher. They stay high. And then as your angles get on top of the head pin, a lot of times the scores start to go the other way. They start to come down. So striking a lot in that environment isn't the priority. It's finding a ball that you get to the pocket and when you miss, you get nine. So if there is a ball that is missing out of a lot of people's mm -hmm. arsenal, regardless of where they fall in those categories, it's that that type of ball. Right and back there. to what you'd said earlier, people think that the most more expensive ones are going to work better, and these, generally speaking, are not the most expensive, and they're the least hooking. When I was actually looking for examples for this, this is the toughest one I had to find examples for because every brand basically has one like this. They might have, I think, uh, the counterattacks they made in solid and hybrid, I think. So they might have two versions of it. And like the matchups, there's a couple different versions of it. But most of the uh, ball companies don't create a lot of these. I just came back from Detroit. I laid out two matchups. And I laid out, uh, um, and then, um, uh, of course, we've used a, a t all kinds of Tundras. But the other ball that we've had success on the team in the last two years was the Turbo R. Okay, yeah. They've had a lot of success, especially I had a few players that were a little bit softer with their speed, and they were very speed dominant. Um, we actually moved that ball up into their late hook ball, and they love not fighting the front part of the lane, and they love being able to throw the ball a little softer, and the ball never over transitions. So just because it's a little less expensive yeah. doesn't mean it's bad. Right. So the examples that we have here, uh, you can see this Beast Pearl. If you actually look at what we wanted for this ball, this ball is <laughs> a little stronger for this player. But again, this speed dominant player, remember the consistent that we've had on all of his layouts is that technically they're slightly outside of the realm of what we say is acceptable. But because this player, like I said, we, he does not, if he can't throw a little hard and still be comfortable, because in his instance, the miss, whether it's right or left, didn't matter as much for this, this specific player. It's whether he can throw it a little harder or not. If you can give him a ball that if he's allowed to miss a little firm, he's almost always going to keep it in his bag. If it's that one that he's got to miss soft for it to give him that still get nine, he doesn't like it very much. But again, 17.1 boards of total hook, uh, a little bit less, a lot less angle than some of his other stuff was, um, 6.2 degrees total. Well, and again, it's just that the RGs are a little bit lower than your high RG, but they're, they're not definitely low yeah, RG. For sure. Um, and he's got the pin down layout. Um, and then, you know, if you, if you know that shape that's in the beast, that really simple symmetrical mm -hmm. shape, um, you know, that shape's been used for a million years in oh, bowling, yeah. and it still rolls very, very <laughs> well. And, and again, this, this player happens to have a lot of confidence in this ball. Confidence is a big deal. Go to the balance player, uh, Tundra. He said that was one of their favorites. So 60 by 5.5 by 65. You can see 14.5 boards of hook, I think. I can't read that very well. And then a lot less angles, so 5.5 degrees of total change of direction. And then the burn ball for the rub dominant player, another Tundra. You can see the layout's a little bit different on this one. It's 20 by 5.5 by 70. So some people would say that's kind of a weird layout and an early hooking layout. How did you guys end up with that choice? Or Well, remember, um, um, this is, well, they don't know this, but this is a two-handed bowler. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Okay, and, and this particular bowler likes to see the lane a little bit differently. But the... Again, the the, uh, the the drill angle on symmetricals are really not that important. Um, what's important is um, the RG, the diff of the ball, the type of ball, and the and the cover. And uh, so this ball has a very the Tundra super long transition doesn't really change direction very much. And uh, so don't don't I wouldn't pay attention to the drill angle on this particular ball. So then the urethane ball. Uh, we made a note here to pick the diff carefully, and what we meant by that is there's a couple of them that are out there with stronger cores, um, and a lot of times, depending on what you're trying to use it for, those urethanes with a stronger core end up making the ball try to read even earlier on the lane, and will cause you to not be able to use it in the environment you're trying to kind of use it in. Isn't that the way you kind of explained it to me? Yeah, so um, we know that reactive balls hydroplane more on the oil and respond um, 
respond to the dry, whereas urethane is much higher friction values in the oil and they respond less to the dry. So for a, a lot of situations, um, and the beauty of the purple really is it's lower diff, um, and that combination allowed that ball to be um, much more versatile in a lot of different parts of the lane. It, it maintains shape. When I see players with an expectation that have too much flare, the combination of that cover forces them to the left, and then all the flare forces them to the left. And now they're asking that ball to recover on the back end. And their angles, if they try to go up the lane, which is really the purpose of the urethane ball, the ball wants to go left. And then when they go left, the ball doesn't recover on the back end. So just be careful how much flare you use, um, what ball you choose, and then what layout you put on it if you have one of those cores that, that does have quite a bit of differential. So for the speed dominant player, purple hammer, two six five or excuse me, fifty five by four and a half by thirty five. If you remember the total hook from his other stuff, this is nineteen point one, and then it's five point six degrees of total angle. So thousand surface. For our balance player, purple hammer again, fifty five by five by thirty five. Nineteen point five boards a total hook and six degrees of angle and then for the rub dominant player again a purple hammer and it was 55 by four and a half by 30 a little bit less angle so 26.9 boards of total hook and then only 8.9 degrees of uh, change of direction you know this, this this is you know urethane and and i've really started to change that word because for a lot of people urethane is for some reason a four letter word and um, it's it, it certainly is a weapon in a competitive bowler's arsenal, but some of the things I hear, well, women don't need urethane. And I would argue the, the opposite. Mm -hmm. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, don't ladies like to keep it in front of them? Mm -hmm. Don't the ladies like to throw it over their toe, you know, to the inside? Of course they do. When you have a ball like a purple, and I'm sure the next generation of urethane that all the manufacturers have learned, you know, about the purple ball, you know, having a, a cover, call it whatever you want, that's a bit earlier, that is smoother on the back, that still continues and doesn't die out. I mean, who wouldn't want that type of reaction? So uh, I believe you're going to start to see people try to get as close to this reaction as possible because it's so versatile. And I don't have a problem putting this type of ball, especially in a woman's hand or a kid's hand, because or seniors hand because their miss tends to be the inside mm -hmm. um, and they they prefer a hold over swing mm -hmm. right and so when you put it in those terms the light bulb goes off and they yeah. say well you can't score as high as your thing and I'm like you know I know a lot of people <laughs> that score really high when they can throw it over their left toe and stand to the right mm -hmm. and have just enough angle to slap the 10 out you know it makes sense so now what we did was we put each of those arsenals into kind of a chart so you could kind of see the transgression of or the uh, way that they're going through Transition. Them. Transition, yeah, transgression. That's the other direction. That's when you're bowling <laughs> bad, it's trans <laughs> transgression. Um, so on the fresh, he, remember this player, he had the gravity evolve uh, with thousand surface. On the ball up for him was a pink widow. You can see the layout there. So a little bit less flare on that layout. Also a pin up versus a pin down. And now he's gone to a little bit less surface also. The late hook ball was his Roto Grip MVP. So again, layout, you can see the flare. We're giving it even a little bit less flare, plus that ball naturally had a little less flare, plus it's a symmetric versus an asymmetric. And so now we're going to a 2,000, 4,000 Aberlon. Then he's got his burn ball, which is his beast. Again, less flare with the layout there. Uh, 2,000 polished with light, uh, light 4,000 Aberlon, and then he had his purple hammer. So you can kind of see how each of those, you can see on the, if you look at just the, if you were to look at just the bowling balls, you would see how the flare is being controlled by we're picking naturally weaker bowling balls other than from the fresh to the ball up. On the layout, same thing. You're going to see we're making them weaker as they go along. And on the surface, the same thing. We're going from more aggressive to least aggressive. So all of those things are working towards going that same direction. And some of the keynotes here is look at uh, the, the their fresh ball, 500, 1,000. You're going to get a different reaction if you go 500, 1,000 or straight 1,000, or 2,000, 1,000, right? 
Okay. So here we really want to make sure that we got enough lines in the ball mm -hmm. um, to, to make sure that the ball slows down. It's really about where does the ball slow down. And then on the other side, you can see you got 2,000, 4,000 on the Aberlon because we want it smooth. But again, we want a little bit of grit for That's this speed for because he's a speed dominant player. So the balance player, which was Hanky, like we talked about, so similar type of uh, flow in there. So uh, web tour with four and a half uh, pen to PAP, thousand surface, well two thousand one thousand Avalon, and then the Futura, a little bit less flare, so we're going to five degree or five inches, and then a two thousand Avalon. Then we got the track heat, which a uh, five point five or five point two five, so five and a quarter layout with four thousand Avalon. Then we got the Tundra. Even a little further, so the pen to PAP is five and a half now with a 4,000 polished on it. And then his urethane ball uh, with a five inch pen and uh, a thousand Aberlon. Yeah, so if you notice the, the balls are similar, not exactly the same, but they're similar categories and the layouts are tweaked mm -hmm. and the surfaces are tweaked. Yep. Similar type of thing here with the rev dominant player. So you go web tour, chaos, kinetic amethyst, tundra. So some similar balls in similar spots, but same thing with the layouts. The one thing we did a little different on the layout for his amethyst was with just a hair stronger. We use a little different surface on that um, for what this player specifically likes to see. So in general, for an ideal arsenal for somebody, we've got their fresh ball is going to be a low RG, medium differential, solid ball, um, probably around 1,000 surface. Their ball up is going to be a low RG, high diff, hybrid ball with probably a 2,000 Avalon. Their late hook ball is probably a medium RG, medium diff pearl with 4,000 Avalon. Their burn is going to be something high RG, low diff with a 2,000 polished probably. And then their urethane is probably going to be a lower diff urethane with that 2,000, 1,000 Avalon. I'll tell you what, you take that type of arsenal and then just modify the layouts and the surfaces. Um, need I say balance holes till August? Because I'm till Chad comes in and knocks on my door and says, <laughs> "Dell, you can't use balance holes anymore." I'm still using balance holes because um, they're wonderful tools and they're great ways to tweak things. Um, you can see here if you follow something similar to this, man, I, I'll tell you, it makes it simpler, gives everything a role, and then you understand what each ball works. And it's they're very separated here, you know, and they're again, it's like a golf bag. So then also the fine tuning part of it. So art is in the eye of the beholder and everyone will have their own interpretation. So a lot of times people will come to the training center and they'll ask Dell for advice and they'll ask me for advice and they'll ask Randy, well, you guys all told me different. Well, yeah, but if you really dissect what we told you, we told you the same thing, but yeah, he likes tundras more than I like tundras. So he suggested tundra. I didn't suggest the tundra. I suggested something different. It's just, we each kind of have our preferences of what we want. So, but a lot of times this is where the confusion comes because also people will go on the internet and they'll listen to a ball review or they'll read a ball review and say, okay, this ball is good for this. Well, what it doesn't really always explain to you is, well, that's for that type of player. Well, you're not that type of player. So that doesn't necessarily mean that same thing for you. So in your instance, like the rev dominant player, generally speaking, I'm not going, or excuse me, speed dominant player. I'm not going to go with this, an asymmetric for their fresh ball. But for that specific player, I did. But that was something that's the art part of it, where us behind the scenes are making those choices. And that's what each, where you got to really have a good pro shop guy that you trust to be able to help you make those decisions. Well, and the, the, the good news is there's more than one way to skin the cat. The bad news is there's more than one way to skin the cat. And yeah. so, and then every, if you have an ego and you're pretty good at what you do, everyone thinks their way is the best. Right. And so, what you need to do is understand an outline um, of what you're trying to do. And that's why we showed you the patterns and we showed you and we're teaching you some just general concepts and the rest of it. And then the better the player gets, especially if they're field players and they're very visual, there's an art to the game. It's, mm -hmm. it's very artistic. So a lot of times they can do things with a layout that may not make sense to me and you, but they're doing something with their hand and it looks good to them. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line with my students is my job is to give them confidence. Mm -hmm. And how many times have you walked in a bowling center and you're watching somebody and you go, that's the best guy here. And he's playing a part of the lane. Like, how's he doing that? Well, I don't know. He's just scoring yeah. because all we care about really and why you guys are listening is how do I use this information to improve my score, my students score. 
So that's that's the confusing part of this is we have a lot of choices and there's an art to the game. Mm -hmm. So again, going through the arsenal a little bit, if you're looking at it from a tournament player's perspective. So I'll let you kind of talk through what you were thinking with each of them. Yeah, so it, it's very common today, and it's wonderful to see. It wasn't like it is 10 years ago at, at, at Junior Gold where on short patterns, play, people are playing second arrow. They're, they're getting out on the gutter. They're sliding right of the, the second dot and see a ton of urethane, which cracks me up because those are the balls I used when I was on tour. And, um, and they're very popular and they're, they're a heck of a, they're a heck of a tool. And then um, what you need is the transition ball. Now that's something that flares less. That's reactive, usually pinned down. And I say, usually, you know, so all of you don't freak out to say, you know, when the, I move in and I throw it at the gutter. Well, maybe you do. If you don't, if you, you might bowl in a center where the far first five boards are pointed to the gutter and you can't do that. Um, but here's where a used bowling ball is wonderful. You know, something that has a couple hundred games on it that is kind of baked out. They don't they don't hook anymore. Man, there. This is where, really where this ball will work wonderfully because it's really a step above a urethane ball. It's a little bit stronger, mm -hmm. and and I mean, let's be honest too. And a lot of times on fresh, urethane doesn't shape right, and you get you got to go to something else. So on the medium. Something benchmark, something pinned down, usually only something symmetrical because it's a bit more controllable. Um, the transition points, the, the length of the curve of the hook phase is a bit longer. It's easier to read. Um, and then your next ball is going to be something where you uh, ball up, um, where you have more differential, usually an ASIM. Um, and then you exploit that that area that's that's drier, but it hasn't cliffed yet. And so you need something that's going to add friction in the mid lane and down the lane that's actually going to open that area up. And then for your long. Again, this is where your pin and ASIM is really, really good. And you need something that when it sees a little bit of friction, it's going to start to rev up and it's going to change direction in a shorter distance. Something uh, for those that are speed dominant, especially when the pattern gets a little bit longer, this is where they struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they're going to use something where the differentials and the intermediate diffs are going to make that ball spin faster in a shorter distance and change direction. And then as the lane starts to transition, you kind of take that same theme a little bit deeper with, with uh, smaller angles. And you're going to use basically the same type of thing, only it, everything's going to be a bit weaker. Mm -hmm. so a cover that's going to get further down the lane with a little bit less flare something pin up. And then at this point, if it, you stay on the lane long enough, now you can go to your burn ball because they're going to wet dry from the fifth arrow. Right. And you really don't need something that's going to change direction and something that's just going to hit the ball track in front of the head pin and just tip. So for a five ball arsenal, when you're limited to those types of things, you're going to choose from, this is generally kind of the strategy that we go with that stuff. So we want uh, the ball that we like for fresh on short, the ball that we like on fresh on medium, and the ball that we like for fresh on long. And then the other two balls that we're going to use are going to be the transitions. So it's likely going to be probably our late hook and our burn ball probably, but yeah. depending on the specific player and what they like. And then what you got to do is you got to change each of those surfaces to where you'll end up probably using your long ball on the medium, but you use it in a different way on the medium than you use it on the long. Exactly. So, um, the most important ball in, in this arsenal, they're all really important, but that that transition for medium and long, ha that ball has to be able to handle that both. And then if you just watch the, the tendencies of junior gold, once you get to the cut um, and then in world bowling, they've pretty much eliminated the short bank, you know, all your patterns are going to be in the medium bank usually. And so, you find a transition ball that will meet, meet that criteria, then that pulls double duty. You may have to change uh, surfaces, um, but the rest of them are pretty specific, fresh, medium, fresh, short, fresh, long. Um, and then uh, this is where the burn ball comes in. You know, that high RG, low diff ball. Mm -hmm. You can use that on short. You can use that on medium, on a shorter medium, if the scores get really low and you need to keep it in front of you. Because the ball's high RG, you can use a ton of surface on it, and it won't hook early. Mm -hmm. um, so that is pretty much the arsenal I go to when you're going to a field where you're going to see multiple length patterns, and you pick balls with layouts that have um, multiple purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, they're pretty versatile. 
So then the other customization that comes down to is you got to think about the environment, which we talked a little bit about. That's the first thing we started with was how the lanes transition. But what patterns are you going to be bowling on? What lengths? What surfaces are you going to be bowling on? How old is the surface? How long is the event? What's the skill level of the players in the event? Is there limitations I have? Like is it a junior gold event or a college event where I'm only allowed five? So and you'll take those those different types of things there, and you're going to use that to choose your final arsenal and also to kind of tweak your surfaces to match up to what you're doing. So if I know I'm bowling on uh, Pro Amvalane that's fairly new versus HPL that's been in for 20 years, I'm going to probably go with slightly different starting surfaces for both of those. No doubt. And, you know, when we go to college, during the regular season, the formats are all over the place. So one of the things I need to know is how many re-oils are they're going to be. Mm -hmm. Because if I do get a re-oil after lunch or when they make the cut, then I can bring in other balls to the fresh because I know I have time to re-hit the surfaces. So um, all of this information is pertinent to the balls you choose, the surfaces, and so on, because at the end of the day, you're trying to have as much versatility in any situation that happens. So that's why you've got to you've really got to dig into a lot of that stuff because the people that pay attention to that create the most opportunity for their players to score better. So that is the core of the information we're going over.